Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Annie Schultz. I'm a volunteer for JDRF, and I actually work with uh, Kelly Gepner, who I'm going to talk about briefly um, at the Venoroya Research Institute at Virginia Mason. Um, Kelly is a native East Coaster, and I'm not going to judge her for that, as the West Coast is the best coast. But she got her Bachelor's of Science at Pennsylvania State and then worked in the pharmaceutical industry in Philadelphia, which she calls farm country. Um, and then she actually came here to Seattle and earned her master's at the University of Washington. I will also not judge that she's a husky because I'm a beeve. Um, <laughs> and she went to work for Nova Nordisk, and now she's at the Benaroya Research Institute. So that's all the, you know, on paper stuff about Kelly, and I will give the other side of Kelly. So I started working at the Benaroya Research Institute. Um, I like to say that I get to work in science and research for type 1 diabetes, but I am not a researcher, which is the best of both worlds. I didn't have to go to school for a bunch of stuff. But I have type 1, and my dad had type 1, so type 1 diabetes research was very um, personal for me. And when I started learning about research and the processes and the various components and people who interact with research, um, I got really excited, and I joke that when I get in the elevator at BRI, I always want to hug everyone because there's all these people that are working to do research and, and cure me in type 1 diabetes. And so Kelly works in a lab, which you guys don't have access to speaking to the people that are actually looking at cells and doing these things typically. So I'm really excited to introduce Kelly. She's a research tech. Uh, I have yet to hug her in the elevator, but look out. <laughs> so provide a warm <laughs> welcome for Kelly. She's going to talk about T1D immunology. My paperback. Thanks, Annie. I will be looking for that hug on Monday. Um, okay. Hi, as Annie said, my name is Kelly Gepner. I'm a research technician at Benaroy Research Institute, and today I'm going to teach you about immunology and specifically how it relates to type 1 diabetes. Now, can I see a raise of hands of people who really liked science in school? Yes, these are my people. <laughs> All right, now, maybe if science wasn't your cup of tea, raise your hand. Oh, there's not too many. Okay, great. Don't worry. This is going to be fun, and you're going to learn something, and maybe I can convert you to a science nerd after this. Okay, so I come to you today because uh, this is me when I was one years old in 1979 in the hospital. I was a pretty sick kiddo. Uh, weekly doctor visits, uh, in and out of the hospital, and it's because I had severe asthma and was pretty much allergic to the world. Um, in the 80s, it was really difficult to control this kind of asthma and allergies, um, and we didn't really understand much about what was going on with the immune system. I was fortunate enough to outgrow the severity of my disease, and um, but being around all the doctors and nurses, all the time, they inspired me. And at 10 years old, I proclaimed to my pediatrician, I wanna be a doctor when I grow up. And she said, no, you don't, <laughs> don't be a doctor. <laughs> so instead, I went on to become a scientist. Um, and I also went on to play roller derby, but we're not gonna talk about that today. That's just to make you like me. <laughs> um, let's see, what else is there to say about that? I think that's it. Uh, yeah, so hopefully, we can uh, go on and talk about our immune system. Uh, so what is autoimmunity? Can anybody give me an example of an autoimmune disease? <laughs> Sir? Psoriasis. Psoriasis, yes, very good. Can anyone else give me an example? <coughs> Rheumatoid arthritis, yes. What about a disease that JDRF is really <laughs> integral in funding research for. Anyone? Everyone? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Type 1 diabetes. So the definition of an autoimmune disease is when your body's immune system mounts an immune response to one's own cells, cell products, or tissues. And you guys gave me all great examples of autoimmune diseases. And the fact is that one in 20 Americans lives with an autoimmune disease. That's millions and millions of people. And the rate of which uh, autoimmune disease is uh, occurring is rising every year. And we don't really understand why. So this is why we need to do research. So as you pointed out, 
Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. And what is the goal of doing research on type 1 diabetes? Well, our first and foremost goal is to prevent and find a cure for diabetes. And how we're going to do this is that we need to block, impede, or regulate our immune response. And what this would mean if we could control the immune response for those who are newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, we can preserve the function of their beta cells. If their beta cells stick around longer, they'll have natural insulin secretion. For those who have had long-standing diabetes, if we could figure out how the immune response is working, um, we can replace their beta cells and then have those beta cells survive longer to produce natural insulin. So that's really our goal for doing research. So how are we going to go about preserving these beta cells? Well, first, we have to understand the immune response. And that's what I'm going to talk about with you all today. So maybe you can understand the key players it, that, that, are occur or that are taking a role in this immune response. So when the next time your physician or someone's talking about an antibody or a cytokine, you will be like, ah, I heard that before. That girl talked about that. So we're going to understand our immune response. Again, we have, then once we understand it, we're going to impede, block, and promote regulation of that immune response and ultimately preserving beta cell function. So let's first talk about the players in our autoimmune response. Did you know that all of your immune cells floating around in your blood come from your bone marrow? Uh, they come specifically from these progenitor cells. That is just a fancy word saying that this cell can turn into many different types of cells. This progenitor cell called a hematopoietic stem cell can take two paths. The first path it can differentiate into is called lymphocytes. And lymphocytes, maybe you've heard of lymph nodes, these cells hang out in your lymph nodes. The second type of cell that these stem cells can turn into are antigen presenting cells. So of the lymphocytes, we're going to talk about a T cell and a B cell today. And of our antigen presenting cells, we're going to talk about macrophages and dendritic cells today. So let's start with the antigen presenting cells. So they're really kind of where the immune response starts. Uh, but maybe you're wondering, what the heck is an antigen? <laughs> so what is an antigen? It's a substance that can elicit an immune response. Can anyone think of something that might be considered an antigen? Histamine, pollen, yes. So you, you release histamine in response to pollen. So that's actually a product of your immune response. So that's, that's good. Bacteria, yes. All very good. So yeah, so bacteria. So this is a picture of E. coli. You know bacteria can make you sick. And what that response to the bacteria and what's making you sick is your immune response to it because it recognizes antigens on the bacteria. Um, Viruses, so this is an actual picture of H1N1 or avian flu virus. Viruses have antigens on them that your immune system can recognize and cause you to have all those great sniffles and coughing and headache. And, um, pollen, as somebody mentioned, you can have an immune response to pollen uh, antigens. Parasites and your own body's proteins, so insulin is actually antigenic in type 1 diabetes. So back to our antigen presenting cells. The first type of cell we're going to talk about is a macrophage. Now, the macrophage's job is to eat things to present antigen. Remember, they're called antigen presenting cells. So it eats things to present antigen. And my little cartoon guy is here to sort of illustrate him eating antigens, so those things you might see on pollen or bacteria or viruses. And he gets really happy afterwards. <laughs> and what he does with them, he uh, presents those antigen on his cell surface. So this eating process is called phagocytosis, which is a Greek word that literally means to devour cells and process them. Um, so here I have a little video that I found on YouTube. 
Thank you, interwebs. Um, this is a human macrophage here. And what we're going to see is uh, it phagocytosing or eating these round cells. These round cells are sheep red blood cells, so they're considered foreign to this human macrophage. So it recognizes antigens on the, the sheep red blood cells and is going to phagocytose them. So hopefully it'll work. So you can see there's one, there's going to be one going right there, and this one right here is taking into the cell. So when this, this macrophage eats those and takes them in, it breaks them down and then presents portions of them on their cell surface. Do you want to see it again? Uh, whoops, nope. Oh, I wonder what this is. <laughs> hmm. All right, so maybe we won't see it again. There we go. Okay, so pay close attention to, uh, can you guys see my little finger up here? Yeah, okay. Um, I think one of these guys gets in uh, phagocytosed and over here too. Does anybody have any questions so far? No? What level of magnification is that? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> you can see a human um, lymphocytes and antigen presenting cells at as little as 10 times magnification. So you don't really need that much. They're way bigger than bacteria. Hmm. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, the second type of antigen presenting cell that we're going to talk about is called a dendritic cell. And this is actually my favorite antigen presenting cell <laughs> um, because they're so pretty. Look how pretty this is. Uh, so, its job, similarly to the macrophage, is going to be phagocytosis or he more like tastes his environment with all these awesome branches called dendrites and then presents the antigen on the cell surface. So here's my little cartoon guy again. He picks up an antigen with one of his dendrites. You can see he's kind of licking it, tasting it. <laughs> um, dendrite is actually a Greek word that means tree and you can sort of see maybe why Long time ago, they called these dendritic cells. They sort of look like tree, tree branches. Okay, so our antigen presenting cells have found foreign things or antigens to phagocytose, eat. They present the antigens on their cell surface. Now they need to tell the other cells, hey, come over here, look what I have, and go out and find these things. So they communicate by using something called cytokines. And sort of give you an analogy before we get into what exactly a cytokine is. Uh, think of our antigen presenting cells sort of out in the field doing scouting work. And they need to communicate to tell other cells to come over here and help me out. So they're going to use a satellite phone, beam their coded message. The cell that they want to recruit over to them uh, has a very specific receptor that can understand and read this coded message and it comes it, it knows to come over and talk to the other cells. So what is a cytokine? A cytokine is a signaling molecule that can activate and mobilize cells. That's all you have to need. That's all you have to know about it. It's a messenger that activates and mobilizes cells. So think of it like Morse code. There's lots of dots and dashes and strung together, they make words, and that word sends a very specific code. And those dots and dashes can be rearranged to give a very different code. So that code, again, is our antigen presenting cell out in the field. It's going to send its code. It may say to a T cell, hey, come over here and get this in. Uh, come over here and talk to me. Or it may send a code to 
spontaneously die. So that code can be different every time. But ultimately, the goal of the cytokines is to tell the other cells what to do, either activate and mobilize them. This slide is to illustrate how many cytokines we know exist in humans. So there's a lot. <laughs> um, and the, uh, they're often, uh, you, can, you know it's a cytokine if it has this IL in front of it. A lot of cytokines have that. There are other ones that um, don't have an IL in front of them. They have a lot of Greek letters, sort of like TNF alpha or interferon gamma. So if you hear those, something starts with an IL or has a Greek letter in it, chances are it's a cytokine. Um, and each of these cytokines has a specific docking station that understands that code. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's switch gears to, we've talked about the antigen presenting cells. They have their antigen. They know how to send a message to get the other cells to come to them and tell them what to do. So we're going to talk about the cells that come to them, the lymphocytes. The first type of cell we're going to talk about is a T cell. Now remember, the lymphocytes hang out in your lymph nodes. Uh, T cells are called T cells because they mature in your thymus. So T cell, thymus. And their job is to be a helper. So that's why my cartoon guy looks like a superhero. And his, as a helper, he flies around and talks to the different cell types. So my T cell can go talk to an antigen presenting cell as his first job. So this is an actual microscope picture of a T cell talking to a dendritic cell, which is really a very cool thing to think about happening in your body. Um, its second job, once it talks to the antigen presenting cell, flies over and finds a B cell to talk to. And we'll get to B cells in a second. Uh, how they communicate with each other are through cytokines, which we talked about, the coded messages. And you can see in this cartoon we have some cytokines in IL-21 from this T cell to this B cell giving it information. And in this cartoon we see all these little docking stations or receptors, and it tells that this is a way of cells communicating too. So the cartoon does a great uh, job of showing you what's actually going on in between the cells when they're talking to each other. Now there are a lot of different types of T helper cells, and I like to think of them as flavors. So if you think about vanilla ice cream, just starts out as vanilla, and you can change its flavor by adding strawberry or chocolate, and it becomes a different kind of ice cream. So in our analogy, our T cell is called a naive T cell. It's the vanilla ice cream, it has, and it's naive because it has not seen antigen yet. So the vanilla T cell, our naive T cell, talks to an antigen presenting cell and sees an antigen. And depending on what kind of antigen this is and what kind of signals, cytokines, this antigen presenting cell is throwing out, it will tell this T cell become, become a different type of T cell. So one of those types of T cells, if, if this antigen presenting cell is, is putting out cytokines IL-4 or IL-2, this T cell can turn into what's called a Th2 cell. This cell this kind of T cell is uh, integral in um, helping fight off parasites. It's also integral in antigens that you might be allergic to in, and uh, also in asthma. If, it gets, if the naive T cell gets a different signal from an antigen presenting cell and the antigen presenting cell starts throwing out what we call pro-inflammatory cytokines, the, the naive T cell, the vanilla T cell, can turn into Th17 or Th1. And these, these types of T cells are considered, are, are known to be in inflammatory responses. So you can have good inflammatory responses when you're fighting bacteria or fighting a virus. But you can also have bad inflammatory responses as in autoimmunity. And research has been done that these two types of T cells are implemented in autoimmunity, such as type 1 diabetes. The fourth type of T cell is pretty cool. He's the master regulator, 
um, if this antigen and these cytokines are produced, it will tell this naive T cell to, to become a Treg. And a Treg does exactly what it sounds like. It regulates. And it can regulate the response of these pro-inflammatory T cells and says, stop. Stop making cytokines. Stop, stop doing what you're doing. We don't need inflammation here. So that's all we have about T cells. Let's talk about B cells. This is the last type of cell we're going to talk about today. So B cells uh, are called B cells because they reside in your bone marrow, B for bone marrow, and, and mature there. Um, and their main job is to make antibodies. I think everybody here has heard about antibodies, and we'll get into what exactly an antibody is in a minute. Um, my little cartoon guy shows that uh, antibodies initially are on the surface of a B cell, and when a B cell is activated, it talks to a T cell, it's becoming activated, it shoots off the antibodies to go out and find the antigen that they're specific for. So here we, can, we saw this uh, cartoon earlier where our T cell is talking to a B cell, again, giving it a message through cytokines, uh, having their receptors dock up and talk to each other, and in this communication, this B cell can transform into what they call a plasma cell. And these are the cells, these are the types of B cells that make antibodies. Or they can be, B cell could be driven into what we call a memory B cell. And the memory B cell is very important in um, your immune response and things like vaccination. Or when you get a cold, some of your B cells become memory B cells. So if you see that cold, that virus again, it knows... You don't have to get sick, as sick as you were before. So it, it provides both of these things, the antibodies and this memory B cell, provide memory for your immune system. So what is an antibody? I know in type 1 diabetes we talk a lot about antibodies, a lot. <laughs> and um, an antibody is specifically a protein that's produced in response to an antigen. And you guys probably have seen cartoon pictures of antibodies before, and they're always this Y shape. And this is actually a, crystal, a crystallography molecular cartoon of what an antibody looks like. And the important things to know about an antibody are these parts of um, the Y region up here. These are called the variable regions. And they provide diversity in your antibodies. So when you're making antibodies in response to a virus, your antibodies will be very diverse from the antibodies that are made in response to bacteria or response to pollen. Um, so that's, that's, how you, that's how your immune system can recognize a lot of different things because these are very uh, diverse. So antibodies can be uh, beneficial, as I said, in, in um, uh, vaccination. This is how you have memory to uh, things like uh, when you get a chickenpox vaccine, you're going to make antibodies against chickenpox virus and you're not going to get chickenpox. It's also very helpful to have antibodies in response to a cold or the flu because the antibodies will be made specific to that virus and you won't get that virus again. Unfortunately, antibodies can also be harmful uh, as in, or annoying, maybe, as in uh, Allergies, you will have antibodies in response that recognize cat or dog or grass. Um, if you're severely allergic to bee stings, uh, antibodies are providing memory because you've been stung by a bee before and it remembers that and you will have an immune response. And it's also, uh, antibodies are very uh, harmful and implemented in a lot of autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes. So let's put those players together in what an immune response looks like. So we've talked about them individually, but maybe it's not clear yet how they're all talk working together. So let's talk about this in, in the context of a foreign antigen, and foreign antigen meaning a bacteria or a virus. So say you get a glass sliver in your hand and some bacteria get into your skin. The antigen presenting cell that's living underneath your skin will phagocytose or eat one of the bacteria and then present a portion of it on, a, on the cell surface. So this is antigen presentation. It also activates this 
antigen presenting cell to start making cytokines. And the cytokines are the messengers that call the T cells from far away to say, come over here, I need, there's something you need to look at. The T cell uh, has receptors that communicate with the antigen presenting cell, and it also has these specific docking receptors for the cytokines. See, the T cell is now differentiated into a different flavor. The T cell then goes out and finds a B cell and says, B cell, look at this antigen. I want you to make antibodies to this antigen. And it does that, again, by communicating through receptors and cytokines. The B cells activated, starts making antibodies here, the green ones that will be specific to our green bacteria. It's activated, it sends out its antibodies, and the antibodies find the green bacteria, and that the antibody marks the bacteria for destruction by other cells that we did not talk about today. So does this make a little bit of sense to everybody? Okay, good. So let's talk about this autoimmune res or this response as far as, as, as it applies to type 1 diabetes. So in this autoimmune response, again, a response to an antigen that your body makes, um, we have your islet cells with perfectly nice beta cells down here making insulin. And this little uh, lightning bolt is supposed to represent some kind of trigger and there's a lot of debate about what that trigger is. But something happens that these causes these beta cells to start dying. And when the beta cells start dying, they're releasing things like insulin or GAD into the periphery. And these are, uh, these are taken up oops, wrong one, by your antigen-presenting cells that sort of live around your pancreas. And the antigen-presenting cells take up the insulin, take up the GAD, present portions of them on the cell surface, start making cytokines to call the T cells to them and say, hey, I have something that you need to look at. The T cells fly in, um, talk to the antigen presenting cells as okay, got it. I'm gonna go find some B cells to activate. They go fly over, find some B cells to activate talk to them through receptors, talk to and activate the B cells through cytokines, and the B cells start making antibodies to insulin and to GAD and marking these, uh, an uh, marking these things that should be not considered harmful for destruction by cells. And you can kind of see now how this loop starts happening of immune response to, to something that, that should not elicit an immune response. So here's some actual photographs of a mouse islet cell, um, just to show you that we know this is happening in, inside our bodies. So in this mouse, there's a perfectly healthy islet cell with its beta cells in here. And then that trigger happens, and that trigger starts recruiting antigen-presenting cells and T cells, you can see, is sort of mobilizing this army around the islet. And then eventually, the the T cells and you know, the B cells with their antibodies and the other, uh, other immune cells have destroyed all the beta cells here. And if there are no beta cells, then we lose insulin secretion. So now that you understand a little bit more about your immune system, let's talk about ways to impede, block, or promote regulation of this. Uh, so there are a couple different strategies in therapy. And one of the strategies is to block communication between the cells. The example I'm going to talk about today, or so I guess, block communication sort of um, like a wall but in Berlin to block communication between East and West Germany. People were not allowed to talk to each other then. The example I'm going to talk about today is anti-CD3, or teplizumab. Um, this is a manufactured antibody that's kind of like the antibodies that your body makes. So the antibodies that I was showing you in response to antigens. This, this is a man-made manufactured antibody to recognize an antigen receptor on a T cell. So you can imagine that if the idea is to send an antibody that recognizes this communication receptor on a T cell, it won't be able to talk to other cells. 
So let's think about this in the context of our autoimmune response. We have our trigger, our islet cells start dying and releasing antigens such as insulin and GAD into the periphery. Our antigen presenting cells come and take that up, process it, present antigen, send cytokines out that call the T cells in. But now we have anti-CD3 and the anti-CD3 antibody is blocking or putting a wall up for this communication between the antigen presenting cells and the T cells. So because this T cell cannot be educated to go on to a flavor of T cell, it cannot uh, do this whole thing talking to a B cell. It has nothing to tell a B cell now, and the B cell can't make antibodies. So this, pro this process is stopped. The second strategy in uh, regulating our immune system is a strategy we're making antibodies, again, an, a man manufactured antibody that absorbs uh, cell products. So here we have, in the case of an antibody against IL-6, so IL, remember, is sort of an indication of a cytokine, and cytokines are the messengers of our cells. So if we can make an antibody that soaks up all of this communication molecule, there won't be a message getting out to the cells to tell them to come over and help us out. So let's, let's look at that in uh, our immune response context. Again, our trigger, our islet cells, or our beta cells are dying, releasing antigen. Our antigen-presenting cells come over, phagocytose the antigens, present the antigens, and start making cytokines to tell the T cell, hey, come over here, I have something for you to look at. But our anti-IL-6 antibody oops, comes and soaks up that cytokine so none of the T cells know to come over here anymore. And if the T cells cannot talk to the antigen presenting cell, none of this downstream stuff happens. There's no B cell activation, there's no antibodies made. If we look at our, um, all the known human cytokines that we, I showed you earlier, the ones marked in red here are FDA approved therapies against cytokines, and they're FDA approved in other autoimmune diseases, not type 1 diabetes yet, or cancer therapies. But there's a lot of trials going on looking at these therapies in type 1 diabetes. In fact, um, BRI has an EXTEND trial that is looking at IL-6 receptor antibody, so blocking that communication molecule. And there are a lot of different ways to intervene in this immune response. But I hope that I've impressed upon you it's complicated. It's a very complicated procedure. So when you might be blocking somewhere, so maybe we're blocking communication between the antigen presenting cells or between the B cells, these cytokines still might be out there. So uh, with our second strategy of binding up our cytokines, our messenger molecules, and maybe in combination with a blocking therapy might help you know, dampen that immune response altogether. Uh, there's a couple different strategies for therapies that I didn't talk about today. One of them, um, ATG, you might have heard this in combination with GCSF. Uh, ATG is uh, antibodies that recognize T cells and they 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 glom onto the T cells, sort of how our antibodies were glomming onto the antigens, and mark this T cell for destruction. Uh, another type of therapy is just giving cytokines by themselves. So not antibodies against cytokines, but giving cytokines. And the cytokines will cause, let's say, a regulatory population to proliferate. And remember, these flavor of regulatory cells stop these other T cells from doing pro-inflammatory things. So, uh, I guess sort of to sum it up again, our, our goal is really to prevent and cure diabetes. And the ways that we're going about trying to do that are either blocking, impeding, or regulating our immune response, which you guys understand more about now. Um, and if we can do this, like I said, in newly diagnosed patients, we can preserve that beta cell function and that natural insulin secretion. Uh, and if uh, you are a longstanding diabetic, 
The research that's going on with stem cells or islet transplant, you can get those beta cells back. And if we can stop this immune process, those beta cells will stay there and secrete insulin for you. So what is out there for me and my loved ones with type 1 diabetes or how can I contribute? So again, I work at Benaroya Research Center. It was established in 1956, originally as a Virginia Mason Research Center. And we're only 259 people, so it's pretty small. Um, but we are one of the few uh, research institutes that specializes in autoimmune research. And our goals are really to um, help people by increasing the ability to predict their disease, target, treat, uh, make better targeted treatment, halt disease progression, or make therapies safer and better for people. Uh, our little institute of 259 people is the Center for the Immune Tolerance Network and will be for the next, I guess that's six years now? Yeah. And also, as you may have seen Carla Greenbaum speak earlier, we're the uh, TrialNet Diabetes Hub. So as far as the types of T1, uh, type 1 diabetes research that are going on at BRI, everyone in this room can participate if they want to. <laughs> um, we have uh, research that we need long-standing diabetics. In particular, the biomarker core or bridge studies need long-standing diabetics to participate. If you are newly diagnosed, we have... Um, we have trials through TrialNet in the Immune Tolerance Network for newly diagnosed type 1 diabetics. If you have family members and you're a type 1 diabetic, we do screening through Pathway for Prevention and trying to understand the genetic component of type 1 diabetes. And if you're a healthy control, we need you too because we need to compare what's going on in a healthy person and why is it different in a type 1 diabetic. And that we couldn't do any of this research without participants who are willing to give their time and their blood for, for all of the discoveries that I talked about. We, we know how the immune response happens because people like you have given their time and their blood for us to figure this stuff out. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, you can find us on the internet or you can visit our table here. And I think Carla showed this picture earlier. This is um, the Diabetes Research Clinical, Clinical Research Program under the instruction of Carla Greenbaum, and um, of which I'm a part of. So that's all. And I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> So Catherine is going to go around and help help people ask their questions. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned there was a debate about the trigger that kills B cells in islets. Can you elaborate about that debate? Um, yeah, so he wanted to know more about the trigger, the debate about the trigger of what's killing the beta cells in the islets. So uh, there's a genetic predisposition to it. So maybe... maybe um, just that your antigen-presenting cells that sort of live around the islets, there's natural turnover of your beta cells, just like all cells. Um, so maybe when those die and you're genetically predisposed, some of those antigens are going out. And, the, and their antigen-presenting cell, because you are at genetic risk, sees that as something that's foreign. So there's a genetic component. There are some people that think there's a viral trigger, you might get a cold, and there's something in that viral antigen that's very similar to your beta cells that then turns on your immune system to say, hey, wait a minute, this is part of the virus, but it's not really part of the virus. So there's a couple of different theories out there. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks for asking. Are there, are there papers? Can you, can you read more about it? Um, I think there are a lot of papers on the um, viral theory. I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head which virus that they think has very similar to to these antigens. But yeah, Thank you. mm -hmm, you're welcome. Um, as yeah. it relates to his question, mm -hmm. um, could it be something that the mom could have had during her pregnancy? I think there is research going on about that too, um, but I don't know off the top of my head. But it, it, I mean, Some medications perhaps. Yeah, I. I don't. I can't answer that question, <laughs> but uh, they do think there's an environmental sort of aspect to it, and that would be an in utero environment could could contribute to it. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. I can just suggest that you read about the Teddy study, mm -hmm. which is looking at triggers mm -hmm. um, long term. But my question is about my child with type 1 diabetes, had, had it for nine years. Now she has antibodies to her thyroid. And I'm wondering if there's research going on at BRI about autoimmune thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering if now that she has antibodies, does that mean she's in stage one of the disease analogous to how we now know if you have two antibodies to, your, to insulin or to islet cells, mm -hmm. you have the disease? Mm -hmm. um, so there have been studies saying that uh, it just it seems it seems very um, I want to say coincidental that there are people with type one diabetes long standing and maybe new onset but I know for certain in long standing uh, type one diabetics a lot of them go on to uh, have other autoimmune problems and there's something just not the immune system is just sort of out of control <laughs> um, there is not research going on at BRI looking at at those uh, two things in particular. Um, but yeah, they, there does seem to be a correlation between having a lot of, having one autoimmune disease and not just having one. You might have two or three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Who, whoever, whoever you want. <laughs> Hi, your um, slide showed the autoimmune response against the insulin and the GAD mm -hmm. in response to the beta cells dying. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the, the beta cells are dying before they get attacked by the immune system. Is they that are. correct? Yes. And so would they die by themselves if it weren't? I always think of the immune system as killing the beta cells, sure. but it didn't look like it. So how do they, would they die by themselves? So or? that initial trigger, yeah, there's something causing them to die by themselves, but there's also natural turnover of your cells. Um, but then you're correct in saying that, so that after that initial spot, your immune system is then activated to start killing beta cells. So it's just that initial thing we don't really understand quite yet. So you answered the question about um, type 1 diabetes and being associated with an autoimmune thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. uh, my son has multiple autoimmune diseases, Crohn's, arthritis, psoriasis, type mm -hmm. of diabetes. The Crohn's presented first as an infant. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if Benaroyal is doing any, you know, cross-disease connection uh, with autoimmune responses in general, maybe not specifically thyroid or one of the ones I right. mentioned, but how the immune system is tied into, you know, the immune, those diseases mm -hmm. manifesting themselves. So we... Don't have a specific study looking at people who have multiple autoimmune diseases, but there are a lot of investigators working in a particular area like Crohn's. We have IBD people or rheumatoid arthritis people or the type 1 diabetes people. I mean, we all kind of work together, and it is of interest to us when we get donors that have multiple autoimmune diseases for testing markers that we think are implemented in both uh, the genetic component is really interesting. I think we do a lot of genetic work at BRI on that. Um, yeah, but I can't think of a specific study where we're looking, we need people that have two or more diseases. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about blocking that action of creating the antigens. Mm -hmm. So can you make that specific just for the insulin and the GAD, or would that block the entire bodily system doing that that fights off colds and flus? So we do, um, the blocking was in, the blocking actually happens at like the cell communication. It doesn't happen at the antigen. Uh, some with antigen, we're doing some um, tolerance studies. So giving oral, there, I know there's oral insulin and GAD studies going out there. So actually giving small doses of those, those naturally occurring things like insulin and GAD to sort of tolerize the immune system. But we don't want to, we can't really block insulin or GAD because that, you're right, that would kind of mess up the natural processes of our, our body. But we are doing studies we're trying to f that are trying to figure out if we give small doses, 
can we tolerate the immune system or teach it to be like, these are okay, you don't need to go after these things when you see them. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Oh, you can yell it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it looks like the body's making antibodies to insulin. Yeah. So when we give our kids insulin, mm-hmm. So long-standing diabetics, you will eventually make antibodies to the insulin you are getting. Yeah. But what does that mean? Are they need more and more? Or? Um, well, at that point, and at the point of your diagnosis, you hardly have any beta cells left. So it's, it's not creating more of an immune response. It's more of a response. So the insulin you're actually getting is is a little bit different than the insulin your body makes. So those antibodies that you're making in response to the insulin you're getting are specific to the insulin you're getting. So it's just a little tiny different than the insulin that you're making. Oops, sorry. Does that make sense? Yeah. The antibodies are very specific. Yeah. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, sir. So theoretically, if your beta cells can be taught to make different insulin, than the antibody, if, theoretically, if your beta cells can be taught to make different insulin, mm-hmm. then your antibodies necessarily would go after it. Yeah, he said, so in theory, if your, your beta cells can make different, slightly different insulin, then your, your um, cells wouldn't go after it. Um, I don't know, because there's the genetic component that you might just have this, these genes that turn on your antigen-presenting cells that are like kind of hyperactive at anything, even things that your own body is making. Does that, does that help you? It's a, it's a good idea. <laughs> um, but I think because you have that genetic predisposition that your body is just going to end up seeing that as something that it should not be there. Yes? To follow up on the question she just asked about um, an immune response to injected insulin. Yes. What are the implications of that? What are the implications of that? The immune system is going to kill the cells that are making the injected insulin. They're not, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's just that it marks the, so if you're having antibodies that are against insulin that you're giving yourself, it's just marking those for destruction, marking that insulin for destruction. And then your body can't use that insulin. So I don't know from a clinical point of view that you have to up the dose. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I am diabetic and I also work So use a microphone. So you can... <laughs> I myself am a diabetic, and I work in a lab. So basically what happens is you know when you're told about an insulin, how it has a period of time that it lasts in the body. So any drug that you take has a period of time where it stays in the body and it has a peak effect, and then that tapers off. That's your body's naturally getting rid of foreign things. So with insulin, it's marked as soon as you put it in, but it stays two hours or 24 hours, and then it's destroyed by the immune system. So that's what, what I think you're talking yeah, about. When so, it comes. so it's marked as mm-hmm. soon as you inject it, mm-hmm. but it's not destroyed until however long it lasts in your body. And you find that out when you learn about insulin. Some of them last for two hours. Some of them last for 24 hours. It depends on the type of insulin, and that affects how it's marked when it goes into your body. It's the same thing with like aspirin or Tylenol. It's marked when you take it, and then it's processed through your body through normal organ processes so that it doesn't stay for the rest of your life. So the implication would be then that it could start being cleared from your body faster. Yeah. So different kinds of insulin, they start, you know, get to their peak effectiveness in less time, like fast acting insulins will start in 15 minutes or 20 minutes or long acting insulins can take up to an hour the type of insulin it is, the type of coating that it gets will affect how long it stays in your body, whether it's a fast-acting insulin or a long-acting insulin. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Pharmacodynamics. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Just for a follow-up on the question, I would like to reply to Nick. You said something that I think some of us are hearing. It sounds like over time, the insulin becomes less effective because the antibodies learn how to attack it. So I'm concerned behind my question. I think maybe heard was, 
working over your lifetime of using insulin, is it becoming less and less effective? And if, if that's the case, what do you do? So he wants to... Yeah, so he wants to know a long-standing, if you're taking insulin over time and your body's marking it, is it becoming less and less effective? Uh, I think the answer, to, the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, but that's why they're always coming out like, with different insulins because some people progress through them quicker than others. It just depends on an individual basis how active your immune system is. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I, I am one of those non-science persons, so I'm going way back to the trigger um, starting this yep. happening. So it seems like that trigger is, finding that trigger is equally, if not more important than doing all the stuff. So she... She wanted to know about the trigger that's initially kicking off that immune response. And your point is that that seems really an important thing to understand besides all this blocking of the immune response downstream. It is. It is a really important thing to understand. But I think, yes, it's a long-term goal. But in the short term, they're try we're trying to stop the immune response is going on right now in people who have type 1 diabetes, I guess. That might be easier to find than what could be Well, I don't know that it's easier because it might be a combination of things. Like it might be you're genetically predisposed, so your antigen-presenting cells are super active, um, but you also were sick when you were two years old with a cold. Yeah, so, no, but I th that's a very good point, that if you could stop that, if we knew what that initial trigger is, then all that other stuff would not happen. <laughs> but, yeah. Yes? Somebody this morning asked a question that I'd like to repeat to you um, about what would a vaccine, they're talking about developing vaccines for type 1, but mm -hmm. a vaccine's job is to produce antigens mm -hmm. to create an autoimmune response. Mm -hmm. What would it look like? So, yeah, it seems counterintuitive, right? Uh, so someone was asking about um, the development of vaccines for um, treating type 1 diabetes. If you're giving an antigen, why would you do that <laughs> if you're going to start an immune response? So one, I think a uh, vaccine is one thing to... Um, it's sort of like the tolerance thing with the oral insulin, the oral GAD to sort of tolerize your immune system like, hey, this is not this is okay. You know, don't don't mark this for destruction. But um I I don't understand a lot about how that fits into the immune system. Because yeah, so it's yeah, you're right. It doesn't make sense that when you get a vaccine for measles and mumps and things like that, you're saying you're taught you're showing your immune system this antigen um if you see this, go after it. Um, so I, I don't understand how it would work in the context of antigens for type 1 diabetes. I'm sorry, I can't answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Nobody understands it. <laughs> yeah. All right, one, yes. <laughs> oh. Mm hmm. This is, this is Deb. She also works at Benaroya. <laughs> that as a lady up front mentioned, there's this big study called the Teddy Study. It's a study on the tri envir environmental triggers of diabetes. And it's being done in three countries. Hundreds of thousands of, of children have been enrolled at birth who are genetically uh, predisposed to getting type 1, meaning somebody's in their family or that they have a certain HLA type. And this study is, I think, a 15-year study. These children are followed from birth mm -hmm. until 15 years, so there will be a lot of data coming out. They have nail clippings, uh, food histories. Uh, you know, every few months, the parents give information on food introduction um, they take stool samples. It, it's looking at anything that may have an effect um, that may, when those children get diabetes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deb. Anybody else?
Yes, sir. Is there any research being done that's linking uh, parasite responses, so hormones mm. and, and the autoimmune responses in relation to diabetes or other yeah. the autoimmune diseases? Uh, so this gentleman wants to know about uh, research being done with um, parasites and how they fit into this autoimmune, res uh, how they might be a treatment, right, for autoimmune response. This is something I'm actually kind of interested in because there is research being done on parasites and sort of skewing your T cell flavors from those Th2 type cells that, that look at parasites uh, from the inflammatory ones to more like those Th2 cells. Um, there is research being done in peanut and in severe allergies. Uh, and I believe in MS, there are research, there's research being done with parasite or parasitic antigens. You're not just getting parasites. <laughs> um, but yeah, because there, there are studies around the world showing that countries that have a lot of parasites don't have a lot of autoimmune disease. And that's that's an interesting correlation, yeah. So, why is that? Why is that? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, one of the theories is that your immune system has something to do all the time instead of uh, looking at your own uh, tissues and cell products and cells as something foreign. It has these worms looking living in you all the time that are not supposed to be there. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you for being a very captive audience. Good questions, everyone.